uh, um, coming in at the moment at quite a rate. So let's give it another two, three minutes. We do have an offer here from Philippus who will serve us Millipup for two and a half thousand per person. It's a good deal. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> I will learn how to make more. Where are you seeing this, Natasha? In the chat. In the I'm chat. talking to the 67 people, man. Hmm. And a lot of Syopsa Exco people on the call. Yay. Welcome. 68, Natasha, and growing. And growing. It's only IOPs, Willem, that talk like this before a book launch. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Aleta is on the call. Hello, Aleta. And Aleta, yeah. Quite a number of good, well, very nice people on the call. And partners, welcome, Emilio. And oh, Dr. Cherry is here. They can chat. Aleta is saying hello. Hello, uh, Dr. T. Hi. Hi. Enjoy the free talk. Oh, okay, guys, I think let's kick off. <laughs> let's kick off. Good afternoon, everyone. A special word of welcome to all our delegates from around the country. There are also quite a number of people from around the world. I know there's somebody from Doha and London and, and so on. So uh, welcome to our launch of our latest book, Our Industrial Organization Psychologists Future Fit, um, a Future Ready. Um, and this is a project that um, Theo Feltzman, with a very competent group, um, that, that worked on this project for quite some time. And uh, it, so we're publishing this in, connect, in, in collaboration with the SAOPSA. It's actually a SAOPSA project, um, and we virtually only the publishers. So um, it was Vladimir uh, Lenin who said, there are decades that nothing happens. And there are weeks where decades happen. So um, I think we all experienced that over the last sort of uh, year and a half, a little bit more. And, um, and the question is that we, the question is, uh, uh, and the question is being directed to any discipline, to every discipline, are they future fit? Are they ready for this new world of work? For years, we spoke about the new world of work, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, we definitely never considered the pandemic, but um, having, having a, a gone through the experience since the last 18 months and plus, um, that um, the whole idea of the future world of work has become a reality. It's now on steroids. So um, it was, I, I, I was very, very excited when Theo phoned me one morning and said that, look, we're busy with this project. Are you guys willing to publish this? Um, I think it's incredibly important. There can't be a, a profession that's more key to the world of work, obviously, than the IOPs. And especially here in South Africa, where we want to untap the, the potential of our people um, uh, tremendously. So let me introduce to you, we have a whole panel. Um, everybody on the screen, you can see they have contributed and were involved in the, um, in the project. Um, the program for the afternoon would be quite simple. I'm going to introduce uh, Crystal Hull just now and Theo. And then Theo is going to make a presentation. And he will, that's after Crystal's um, intro, uh, uh, introductory comments. And then Theo is going to make a presentation around the project. And then after that, we will have um, a, a question and answer discussion session. You're welcome to use the Q&A facility or the uh, chat if you'd like to. So we're broadcasting also live through uh, Facebook. 
I think we have quite a number of people here at the moment. Uh, we've, we're standing on 91, and I suppose there's quite a few on Facebook as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce quickly uh, Theo and uh, Crystal to you. Theo is, um, and, and Crystal as well, they are well known to most people in the IOP um, environment. Um, Theo holds a PhD in industrial psychology. He's a registered, um, obviously, industrial and research psychologist. Uh, he's also an accredited human resource management practitioner. Theo liked to uh, refer to himself as a work psychologist and pracademic. Uh, in the course of his career spanning 35 years, he has uh, seamlessly navigated the worlds of academia and practice. Um, his primary fields of expertise are in the people strategy, organizational re redesign and design fields, in addition to leadership management, large scale organization change and strategic talent management. Uh, Theo has uh, written more than 220, anything from technical consulting reports, articles um, uh, covering the areas I just mentioned. He has authored or co-authored 45 accredited articles, four books, 17 chapters, and a co-edited six books. So he's a prolific author. Um, he, is, he was previously, um, up to 2016, he was the chairman of the department of the IPPM at the University of Johannesburg, and he has been appointed visiting professor to that department. He's also an extraordinary professor at uh, the Stellenbosch uh, Business School. Uh, Theo has led the professional bodies of psychology, industrial psychology nationally, um, of, amongst others as president of SISA and SOPS on several occasions. He's also received various awards for his contribution to this profession. Uh, Crystal is a registered industrial psychologist with more than 23 years experience in education, business and professional services. So a professional, uh, professional interest lies in human capital, positive psychology, Organization Behavior and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, she's a professor in the Department of Industrial Psychology and People Management at UJ, and uh, where she heads up the Industrial Psychology Program. Uh, at the moment, she's also the president of, of, of SAHPSA and uh, the editor-in-chief of the South African Journal of Industrial Psychology. Um, she's a regular speaker at local and international conferences, has published various scientific articles in uh, uh, articles in scientific journals. So welcome to you, Theo, and also uh, Crystal. Um, a job well done so far. Crystal, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Wilhelm, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you are as, as excited as we are on this historical afternoon. So this is indeed a historical moment in the life of Sahapsa, as this is the first book to the best of my knowledge as a proper book as we as a society um, publishes. It also just so happens that um, it came together like a perfect storm, where different events culminated together in perfect timing. What originally started as a project to reimagine a new world of work in the fourth industrial revolution context, and specifically looking at it from an IOP lens, it morphed into something much bigger than we ever could have imagined. And um, it also timed very perfectly with the FOIA R presidential report, and as you will hear, speaks directly to the human element in it. Also, little did we know that a pandemic would fast forward the future lens into already present lens, and highlights many of the findings in our book. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there's no other similar project currently with this scope to look at the role of IOPs playing in, the make, and, and in making sense of this um, fascinating chaos. And this is probably also one of the low hanging fruits and opportunities for us to, to collaborate with similar societies um, on, on, on an international front. This was a project that shifted us out of our comfort zone with the bang. We literally walked the talk throughout the project. And I can remember many funny moments in those initial uh, conferences that we had where we were not sure what we were doing and we were struggling to get the hang of using the tools and, and so forth. But I mean, at the end of the day, it was a learning curve and we managed to do that. It was also an example of how a super team operates and deliver a fantastic project. And I'm sure at the time when we started this project, super teams were not even a real term where it is at the moment. Obviously, we could not have done this without the leadership of Professor Theo Feldsman, 
our stream lead team members, so our some members, participants, assistants, and volunteers, and of course, our publishing partner, Knowledge Resources. And the funding that um, the Department of Science and Technology originally made available for special projects like this. Without all these partnerships and collaborations, this project would not have been possible. So tonight, we as IOPSA is proud to launch our book, Industrial Organizational Psychology is Engaging for the New World of Work. And I'm honored to welcome our project leader, Prof. Theo Feldsman, to walk you through a very brief story of our project and book. Theo, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Will Hallam and uh, uh, Crystal, for the kind words of welcome and setting the scene. Um, and it's going to be indeed a privilege and honor for me to walk you through this project, the story that we, we've set out to tell in this book about the future. Uh, so um, let me just uh, go and share my screen. Um, is the screen, do you see the screen? Yes, it's clear to you. Um, the world is in the throes of the fourth industrial revolution. This revolution, uh, colleagues, is all about a reimagination, a reinvention of a society as we know it. It's a bringing together of vast different, vastly different uh, technologies, vastly different disciplines to create this new world. Um, and this world as much also applies the 4IR to the world of work. It's a world of digitization, interconnectivity, virtualization, automation, and smartness. The Divas world, as we have abbreviated it in our book. So by all accounts, the future is going to look different. Uh, and the question then that we have to pose is, uh, let's see, why doesn't it want to show? Is the future is upon us. Are we as industrial organizational psychologists future fit and ready? And for that, we have to visit the future and make it present. So the, the, the ambit of um, industrial organizational psychology is reflected in the picture on screen. It is about the psychology of the world, uh, of the working person, work, and the work setting. And uh, this is uh, embedded in a certain context. And the question now is, how is this uh, fourth industrial revolution impacting on this world of work and the challenge in front of us to actually then deal with this work in order to create a humane work, a world of work where humane work is. And this is probably going to be the, the, the future challenge of us as industrial psychology, psychologists. And that then is what we set out to do in this project uh, that occurred over a 40, uh, 18 month period and culminated in the book. It was a future search uh, conferencing process with, uh, with an aim to discover and uncover uh, using an IOP perspective, what the workplace of the future is going to look like, what are the trends associated with it, and how do we position ourselves in order to create a humane workplace of the future? What could it look like? And what frameworks should we apply in terms of our thinking? So our aim as a team was really to reimagine uh, the necessary realignments of IOP in all of its facets, its intent, its focus, its content, its mode of delivery and capabilities to this new future world uh, place so that we as a science and a practice can remain relevant and that we as IOP psychologists can be future ready and fit. And the, the project was done by a very enthusiastic, passionate team as reflected on, on, on the screen there. Both more experienced and less experienced IOPs and the more experienced IOPs you can uh, discern by the wrinkles on their face uh, the younger ones, they have got more cleaner faces, which is very nice. Uh, also, the, uh, so the older generation, the newer generation, the diversity in terms of 
of um, gender and race. And the beauty of this for me that came through in our deliberations is that we had these multiple perspectives. And again, that showed me, uh, demonstrated me the strength of diversity of different perspectives, because uh, some of the themes we're going to address ended up in a completely different place where I imagined it originally, but I think that is of the, because of the diversity of our team members. And most of these leads that you see on screen have also played leadership roles in CIOPSA um, as, as, as presidents or presidents to be. So the richness uh, in the team really paid off. So as futures uh, uh, conferencing process was followed over the 18, uh, 18 month period, following as and Crystal alluded a bit to that, using uh, the latest technology, and we had to learn how to use Zoom because it was in the time of lo the lockdowns, how to work as a distributive team and actually build shared mindsets. So uh, the project itself was a demonstration of a fourth industrial revolution initiative. And the project actually was structured around five work streams. And what's important to note from this on, on screen, the interdependency of these different work streams or research streams, which, which then posed the challenge to us, how do we tell and arrive at the coherent story about future fitness and future readiness for both our discipline and for our psychologists? Um, and how you see it started off for the changing world of work. And initially we thought we will then move into, and these streams ran in parallel and interact in an iterative fashion. Then we thought we'll have to look at the IOP response to the changing world of work. But then very quickly realized, no, if we don't have a, va a moral values ethics base, on which we can engage with this changing world of work, we won't be able to make the right, uh, uh, provide the right uh, on answers, even ask the right questions. That that is the base from which we have to operate. Then only does come the IOP response, the future response. Then given the response we have to give to this new world, leverage, uh, from this moral values ethics space, the capabilities, the education, the training, and finally, the knowledge we have to generate in order to be able to, pro to provide evidence, evidence and, and, and enable evidence-based decision-making. So what I would like to now do is tell you the story of what emerged out of these different research streams and indicate to you how it is an unfolding story, a coherent story of progressive ins uh, insight, but that's mutually supportive of one another. And in the end, that is what we'll have to get right uh, as a, 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 science, a scientist and practitioners to give a coherent, uh, have a coherent view about the future. So the first work stream dealt with the changing world of work, where it started. And that was led by Ruwain with Esther and Dieter as the associates to the stream. And for them all, they had to explore the new world that we face, the world of work that is emerging. And the themes they addressed was to look at the, the major contextual shifts uh, in terms of the Vickers world, which is an extension of VUCA world, uh, more comprehensive, uh, the variety, interconnectivity, complexity, up to seamlessness, right down to economic distribution. What are the big drivers for change, so to speak? How do these drivers for change impact on the emerging world of work in terms of organization, leadership, world of work of the, uh, the world, work of the future and the work of the future? And what I would like to do with each of these research streams, not to delve into what was covered, but actually the future fit inside, uh, insight rather, that we arrived at in the end. And that I'm going to give, and I've chosen deliberately color blue because this is blue sky. It's future related insights. And the first one here is that 
industrial organizational psychologist will have to demonstrate visibly and concretely the proactive ability to constantly ask new questions, find new uh, questions, find new answers, and do this systemically. Everything holds together critically because nobody's, nothing is anymore the same, and creatively, and be agile responsive as this new world uh, flows. We are in the age of continuous discontinuities. And we hence then have to be able to engage with this world in this way. It means also by implication, a seamless openness to this world, a contextual intelligence to engage in this world. Otherwise, we are going to become dated. In terms of the, uh, the, uh, the second uh, research stream headed up by Sharon and uh, with Ravi and Simona, then engaged and says, fine, we have this technological innovation developments. They seem to just have very positive things. But then uh, the insight they, they brought us to, to say, but there are dark sides to this technological innovation. It's not all uh, above board. There's uh, self-driven uh, uh, motives that people are doing for their self-interest. This, the so-called surveillance capitalism, the, the technological feudalism, where people are doing certain things for themselves. They are the side unintended negative consequences of for IR, of unemployment, the, the obsolescence of skills, and so the displace, displacement of people. And we are in the process of creating this new world of work. Hence, we need a compass to guide us through a base from which we have to operate. Otherwise, we won't be making the right decisions. Hence, the insight they arrived at for us is that from a, and that's a very important point. In the future, we have to have an internal locus of control. We can't, yes, there will be external regulators, but we have to have an internalized self-regulatory departure point we must act in an uncompromisingly way from a deliberate, and I would like to stress this word, a deliberate, justifiable and relevant IOP, moral values, ethics base to ensure humane work while serving the world of work and humanity at large. And already, uh, please note what we're saying here about the IOP of the future. It's no longer about the discipline itself. It is in a broader space of sustainability, we have to then become very assertive social citizens by serving humanity at large. And what did that result in? And they were bold uh, in proposing what they believe such an MVE base must look like for IOP in the future. And it's called the U. UIE base. It says at the center, the moral principle of the uh, our uh, uh, base is the the moral core principle is Ubuntu. What they're proposing, I become people become people through other people, and that we have to set up workplaces where this is possible. And that it's about the me and the we in interaction, guided by the values of harmony, which says we all include it, everybody's equal, diversity has a prey, but yes, uh, in an equal fashion, it is with where people can act with authenticity and a workplace that's in, infused by justice. And around that, if harmony, authenticity, justice are the values, are the ethics, which is more the visible face of what we do, and we, we, what, where we give guidelines on what's acceptable and unacceptable behavior. And please keep in mind here, colleagues, we're not talking about our ethical code into regulating our relationship with our clients. We're talking about what is the nature of what we have to do in order to create a humane workplace where we have a virtuous integration of people in technology for the benefit of all. And the ethics then, and they went out also here 
to indicate what could be some of those ethics are two elements there, two dimensions. The ethics related to people themselves, such that people must be treated with the respect and dignity also in engaging with technology. People must act and be allowed to, to, to be, uh, act as adults and treated as adults, adults, but also the other dimension of the ethics, not only the people, but the people in the workplace and technology relative to people in the workplace. For example, the privacy of data, not being one-sidedly scheduled for work by the technology, having unbiased decision-making algorithms that do, do not repeat uh, past prejudices and, and the likes. So they were very bold in providing us with this uh, uh, moral values ethic base called the U, uh, U uh, Haji base. Moving on to the next, um, sorry, the next uh, uh, work stream in our story is fine. We now understand the world of work, how we have to position ourselves relative to that world of work. We have a base from which we can operate so that we can render justifiable moral values and ethical judgments in order to create, conceive, to roll out, to, to actually uh, uh, maintain, sustain this world. What is now our response? Now we're kind of returning to who we are and have to be as uh, industrial organizational psychologists in the future. And this was headed up by Natasha uh, Winkler Titus with Kim Lee as an associate. And what they addressed is to say we have to re question the basic questions we ask, uh, the answers we've given to the basic questions we ask about it, and be very critical about it. Why do we exist as, as a discipline? Who do we serve our stakeholders? How do we do it, our mode of delivery? and what are, should be our practice areas in area, and where to, what is the outcome. And to this end, the, the, the blue sky, future fit insight they arrived at was that we need uh, IOPs, future fit IOPs that have a strong, distinct me. They know who they are. They assertive, they purpose-driven social citizens, and they have this passionate collaborative pursuit of sustainable and sustainable in making a difference that is, is lasting, a humane work that will have to work from a multidisciplinary practice areas in order, and that's not up on screen, to arrive at integrated solutions for the workplace, that we have to reconsider and uh, adopt a different engagement mode in terms of a worldview, what was suggested, a complexity, social constructiveness, uh, a worldview, a, a decision-making approach that fits this, uh, this world that's changing rapidly. We can't any longer think in, uh, uh, in linear extrapolation type mode and that our value orientation should that be that of stewards and that we should have a humane fit for purpose engagement delivery, because it's very easy to put technology in front of what we deliver and we disappear and the, the, our mode of delivery becomes uh, in, inhumane and that we at all times must be infused with excellence and striving and hence also have an excellence model against which we measure ourselves. What's not up on screen, what they also ask the question is, what should our name be in future? What is the name of our, uh, our discipline? And the suggestion they made there is that industrial organizational psychology has become dated and that we must rather look at a name that they suggested like work psychology, because work in the new dispensation get any, done anywhere at any time in any fashion, and that is where we have to play. That was the response. But now if you want to give a certain response, you must ensure if you're, you have a goodness of fit response to the context in which you operate, given then your, your moral values ethics base, what are the capabilities that you need in order to uh, uh, be excellent at what you do? And what must the education, training, and development of IOPs then look like? 
And in this, as a work stream was led by uh, Shirlene with Natasha Stark, assisted by Lynette. And essentially what they said is, we have to first understand the, 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 the framework in which we have to look at the IOP, the capable IOP of the future. There must be a contextual fit. The, we must align what we do with the identity of IOP as identified in the previous work stream, the purpose and the legacy that IOP wants to leave behind, and then our uh, moral values ethics base. And in that framework, we have to define, as you can see there at the top, the excellence requirements, and that would then set the parameters for the capabilities we, we will need in future, what education, training, and development must look like, how we must guide IOPs to navigate their careers, and what also suggested was a professional maturity curve. So what was the blue sky uh, future fit uh, insight uh, this work stream arrived at research stream? We have to have an outside in, in other words, start with a context as the frame on the, on the picture, an integrated holistic picture of future fit IOP mastery must be trans uh, translated into a capabilities framework and a maturity of how the, 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 the work of the IOP can grow in maturity over time and being able to do more complex with the imperative for overall synergistic IOP excellence. And they've developed such a capabilities framework. This is, to my mind, without boasting, the most complete up-to-date capabilities framework for IOPs in the world currently. Uh, without, and I'm willing to stand up, as we, what would they say, stand up in the court and defend it. They also then delved into the ETD delivery of this framework and said we need an ETD uh, philosophy. Uh, in other words, the principles according to which, and they've identified seven of these principles uh, uh, that must guide the development, the, the uh, education, training, and development of uh, uh, um, IOPs in the future. Things like it must be very strong identity driven, develop the identity of IOPs. It must be about the whole in parts and the parts in whole. It must look at the present, the, the, the ETD, and in the future, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they proposed reconceptualizing the ETD types and how they must be integrated, how they must be powered, uh, these, the, the, the delivery of that by DIVAS technologies, and how the, the responsible ETD parties, universities, uh, training institution, development institutions, that the, the, the need for the future is that they must evolve and into a tight community of practice with mutually accepted clear roles and suggested who must facilitate it, that, that process as well. Overall, what is the insight they've arrived at? We have to, for the future fit IOPs have to have, we have to grow a meta capability of thinking and act, uh, acting as IOPs ex, uh, in an excellent fashion. That took us to the last uh, in the evolving story uh, to the research, IOP research. And Crystal was the lead here with, with Beatrice. And what they said in the first, they set an agenda in which a framework uh, that we have to look at our research to make it future fit. They said, first, let's select the right conceptual frameworks to inform and frame researchable IOP themes topics. Yes, the scope and the practice of IOP. Then, and immediately the external linkage of IOP, if we want to be so really social citizens with a moral consciousness, stewards of humane work, to actually bring that about, link us to, they linked us to the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals set by the United Nations. Immediately, we can now justify socially what we want to contribute and must be able. And then the recommendations made by the South African Prudential Commission on Fourth Industrial Revolution. On the basis of that within that frame and also what we're 
came out of the, for the, the preceding research streams, identified research themes and topics, and you'll find that in their, their chapter. Uh, there are for each one two topics that they suggest, but there's an appendix to that chapter that lists many more topics. And then they alerted us to the growing crisis of an outdated constraining IOP research paradigm. Can I just give one example of this? 65% of all new knowledge currently is generated outside of universities. The speed at which the world is moving is our research, the rate that we pre produce research, it can't keep up with that pace. So what they suggested and said, Blue Sky uh, Insight, is to be future fit. IOPs, the IOP psychologist in and through his research must demonstrate social relevance and value add, in turn leaving a lasting worthy legacy for, and a key term there, multiple stakeholders, not only management, multiple stakeholders. The changing world of work requires a zero-based reimagination of IOP's research agenda, paradigm, design, design process, in terms of content process and pace. It is as if we have to look zero-based at how we approach our research. And to this end, I just want to illustrate one uh, the one output from what they uh, provided and put on the table, what one can call an aspirational research framework. And uh, what is beautiful for me for this framework, it brings virtually all of the pieces, if not, yes, all of the pieces of the previous work stream together into a research framework. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the context, understand the changing world of work. On the top, the IOP purpose that was set in the work stream of, uh, of uh, Natasha Humane work. In the work stream of Sharon Ravi, the IOP moral values ethics base that our, it must be informed about our picture, our ideal picture of what a humane world of work should look like. The research input, diverse stakeholders, uh, this balanced representative research agenda, the balancing of science and practice in our research, the research in output that's just in time validated, provides just in time validated evidence for real time in time decision making and leaving through our research a true legacy that is tied to and referenced against the UN sustainable goals. And each of these, you'll see there are critical success factors that were specified. So that was the research and that we have to deliver this research. Now we have created these five research streams into a coherent story in order to make sense of this very confusing world. As, as somebody has said, if you're currently not confused, you don't know what's going on. And through what we've offered, in the, the book that is currently released today is actually to make sense of what is up on screen because the future is not going to be the same. We have to reimagine the future and we have to take proactively charge of that future. Otherwise, we're going to become victims of that future, of an imposed future on us where we will be shunted to the sideline. So our hope, of our team is through the book that we have produced, reflective of this thinking five to 10 years out, that this can act as an IOP travel guide into the future, to go and visit the future and enabling and empowering IOPs to make the future present tense. So it becomes a travel guide to accompany you into the future. But the question we then ask, is this sufficient? Shouldn't we go a next step? Because Peter Drucker said, uh, the best way to predict the future is to create that future. future. And hence, what we have set up uh, is on the 2nd of December uh, at the St. George Hotel in Irene, uh, a, a conference, an action planning conference where we want, and that is the last chapter of the book that suggests topics to be addressed, to be actioned in order to get us future fit, to give hands and feet 
to the recommendations made in the book. It's things like uh, in, uh, the, what must be confirming our uh, moral uh, values ethics base, looking at what should the training of IOPs look like in the future. Thank you very much on behalf of our team. Yes, by the way, before I hand back to Wilhelm, is you'll see on screen where you can register for the conference. It is very reasonably priced and we are applying for CPP, CPD points. And we've got big venues, so we're going to accommodate everything, everybody that wishes to come. I think we'll stop at about a thousand uh, delegates uh, because then maybe we'll overpower the future. Thank you very much. Yes, Theo, th thank you very much. Um, that was um, fascinating. It's a mouthful. It's a massive project that you guys have successfully completed. So, uh, colleagues, you can um, you you can post questions if you like to, um, or you can uh, post a comment. Um, in tap the brains of our panel here. So, I've got here, um, and I'm not too sure to who we should direct it, but nevertheless. So Reich asked this question. He says, any views on leveraging this critical IOP agenda in shifting the other industrial age practices held tightly on so by many business schools? We still hear too much rhetoric about people matter, but in practice, the inertia to move away from those old paradigms, example, maximizing a value, shareholder value at all costs, uh, does not correlate to increasing organizational distress. Um, I think, yeah, okay. Who would like to give that a shot? I don't know, colleagues, who would like to answer? I believe um, uh, our space, if we don't deliberately, I don't know whether we should put a, a bombs under our business schools or whatever, blow it up and start afresh. Uh, but I think what we want to get to this conference on the second of, of, of December, and we haven't considered Marissa, and maybe we can, to invite heads of business schools to this, but definitely we are inviting all the HODs of industrial organizational uh, departments at universities uh, to come and join us and think through, and we would like to take hands across them and really think afresh about uh, the, 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 the future of IOP. And I think also our young uh, IOPs must virtually go on a uh, toy toy and say, we demand that you change. Uh, I mean, our old timers like myself can see it out and we can probably last still a couple of years. But I think our younger IOPs must demand that the future be brought into the classroom. Mm. Right, Natasha, you um. want to add? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. As a business school rep, I just have to jump in there. So, Rick, maybe I can I, I can encourage you. I don't know when last you've looked at curriculums of business schools, but the agenda around responsible leadership is definitely something that is being emphasized in business school modules uh, very positively. Um, but I think I'll reflect a little bit on what, we, what we've highlighted in the book. So the question is, this book is uh, directed to IO psychologists, but remember a foundation of what we do is organizational behavior. And in business school curriculum, we do actually teach organizational behavior. So a few key lessons for leaders um, that we've uncovered in terms of organizational behaviors are things like work location and what is happening around that in the, the world of work now. And we've all just lived through it. Um, the whole idea is there is emphasized around the centrality of our humanity in the context of work is a big focus area that we need to, to return to the workplace. And that aligns very well with the whole idea of responsible leadership. Um, if we look at the sustainable development goals, um, SDG 8 speaks directly into humanity in the context of work. And this is areas that the book talks about and that we incorporate in organizational behavior. Um, and then just tactical things around how do you organize work when people can literally work wherever they want to and wherever they can, what has happened to organization design, etc. So uh, yeah, I think uh, Ray, it, you'll be encouraged that there's a lot of alignment back to what business schools are teaching. 
Uh, Crystal also has a view there. Crystal, go for it. Just unmute myself. Um, yes, I think it's a good question. Um, at this morning, I presented at the South African Commerce Dean Association on the future trends of work, and it touched very much on what you just said about employee well-being and how that relates back to do people really matter and do we walk the talk? But this is not really what stood out for me. I think, um, and, and, and maybe that, I don't want to say it's a negative response to what you've been saying, um, Natasha, but it's not so much that we don't know what we need to do, it's that we are slow in doing so. We absolutely lack responsiveness, we lack agility, and we are too slow to get to the solutions. We are too slow to get to the implementation. And that means we are already lagging behind so much that it's gonna take a superhuman effort to get there. And I believe us in the IOP space can really do that, but we need to wake up. We need to realize that, you know, um, with, with our lack of responsiveness, it's, it's a golden opportunity just lost. So, so for me, it's not so much that, you know, we don't know what to do, we do know, but we are slow in doing so. We are suffocated by a over-regulated higher education um, framework. We um, are suffocated by working in silos, by not working with industry in collaboration with these kind of things. And I think if industry starts playing a major role in curricular development and curricular responsiveness, we might start seeing action much sooner or rather, um, earlier, earlier rather than later. Well, Helen, can I just make a footnote to what Christelle has said, because I've been in that space, it takes five years to get a new qualification or the significant revision of a qualification through the system. You can imagine how fast, how much the world has moved on in five years by the time you introduce the new qualification. Yeah, well, then it's out of date already. Uh, Shaleen, uh, do you want to add to, uh, to the discussion? Yes, thank you, Willem. Um, I think coming from an organizational perspective, you know, working in learning and development, leadership development, I think IOPs often miss uh, bringing their scientist um, practitioner view into the world workplace and building on the strength of our science. Um, it's tricky though, because you know, we, need to, we need to be able to engage leaders in a manner where they stop and listen to us. And I think that's, that takes a personal attributes that IOPs need to develop. So firstly, I think we need to, to know ourselves, you know, have the self insight to understand if we can't go it alone, we need to collaborate with other IOPs internally to our organization, but also we need to look at, um, at including other disciplines, uh, multi-disciplines. I think we, we, we act as um, brother and sister of HR professionals, but we do know that we both bring a different lens to solving humane problems in the workplace. So I think it is about getting um, as confident, assertive model social citizens. It is about garnering the support from the science, but then being able to translate it into the current context of the workplace, which is extremely complex, as well as how can we be one step ahead of, um, you know, of, of leaders in the organization, um, of, us, of our um, communities who rely on us so that we can lead the way and role model the way rather than being um, asked to, to lead, you know, society and what they, are, what they are suggesting. We need to be in a position where we can be suggesting how do we change the workplace to become a much more humane workplace. And I think the, the emphasis here is we can't do it alone. Okay, Shaleen, Shari, thank you very much. Um, so the questions and the comments are streaming in. Now I've got a very interesting one here from Maris Ungaro. Which disciplines do you see as core partners to redevelop IOP's cap capacities? Um, um, Wilhelm, I'm just going to start that, but I think Shaleen would probably carry on in terms of okay. the development. But in Go terms of what the IOP does, um, a key thing that we found is obviously collaboration. The, uh, the days of working in silos have long gone. Um, so if you're on that train, I suggest moving platforms very quickly. Collaboration is the key. Um, so things that we found, uh, um, apart from our regular suspect, like the other psychology domains and um, 
sociology and cross-cultural uh, psychology, but things like um, anthropology and sociology, the behavioral economics, um, working with engineers and technologists that are designing these systems that basically create new human beings and new human behaviors. Those are the, the spaces. We don't have to become experts, but we have to work alongside them. Um, but but I think, um, I see Kim has her hand up as well. And then maybe Natasha or Shaleen wants to comment, Kim. Yeah, can I quickly just comment before you come, Kim? I know that um, Paul Norman says to me that uh, at MTN that he's got a multidisciplinary team there already, uh, anthropologists and economists and behavioral economists and so on. So you cannot um, go without this sort of multidisciplinary approach anymore. Uh, Kim. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Natasha. I think something else that we also need to mention and what we finding, what I'm, I'm finding in the work this is working a lot more closer with our people data and analytics teams. So as psychologists or as industrial psychologists before, before, I always joked and said, no, Excel spreadsheets are not for me. I feel like they have now become my best friend in terms of how I do my work in the sense that they inform um, different practices, shifts in behavior that I need to consider and also give me further insights. So I think we also need to work closely from a data perspective if we're looking at being technologically enabled and empowered, working more closely with our data analytics teams to, to upskill ourselves. Um, to take our work forward and also to give insights into what the changing world of work would look like, but also to, to base what we say. So to Shaleen's point around the role we play and how we need to lead. And Adasha also means, mentioned being responsible leaders. So as an IOP in the workplace, using that data now and using the insights from the data to, to basically state our case um, and also to, to, to lead from a point of um, you know, evidence-based learning or evidence-based research in how we're doing our work so that we can show our relevance and show how the role of an IOP has shifted and is constantly evolving and shifting as well. Great, thank you. Um, Naomi Kisleter asks here, in my corporate wellness sessions, I've been asked how leaders move from the old traditional style mode of delivery with humaneness, empathy, and authenticity and still follow company policies. Any thoughts? I'm gonna um, take so that. Yeah. Sorry, you can. Okay, can you want to go first, Sharon? Yes, let me let me go my first. My sister and I wanted to answer the question, but it's okay, Sharon. You can go. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to highlight the issue of who are these people we're speaking about, because I think the core of this whole project is to bring the human back to the center. So we are trying to use old maps to find this new place that we've woken up to. We're needing to listen from a different place. We're needing to show up in a different way. And it's a core muscle that we have to develop. It's not going to happen overnight. We can have all these brilliant programs, but at the end of the day, it's about people. And it starts with my own self-awareness as a leader. So when I understand who I am and I understand how I show up, it enables the other people that I work with to show up in a different way. So Naomi, your question really, when leaders are holding on to the old way, it's to step out of their comfort zone, to step out of the things that they know, the things that are familiar, to get comfortable with the mess, get comfortable with the not knowing. And with that, develop new ways to remain curious, to be courageous, and to actually be bold and try out a different way of being. And I think if we use our superpower as Africans of Ubuntu, I am because we are, we'll see what becomes possible because we are using new maps for this new world of work. Look at this diverse group. It became possible because we moved away from the old maps that said only academics, only seasoned researchers. But here we are with young people, with old people, with middle-aged people, and we did an outstanding piece of work. So bring the human back to the center. Mm, fantastic. Guys, I'll, uh, Shireen, well, you can have I, I wanna add, I wanna add two things in terms of building, you know, changing the, the lens of leaders who think traditionally. There's two things we need to do. Firstly is having the user in mind. So we call it UX. Some call it design thinking principles. So as we, as we assess, design, develop our interventions, we need to always include the user, the leader, the end user, 
you know, not only come from an inside out lens. Secondly, um, Willem, we need to we need to include change management. You know, we often um, launch great leadership programs such as a wellness program without change management strategy. So if this is if wellness and mental health is a strategic initiative of a business, they should couple it with a very thought through change management team who can, you know, create the brand, bring the marketing, you know, um, have the social media savvy, the digital savvy um, lens and, and create, you know, impetus and, and, and momentum around changing the traditional leadership view. I think without the, you know, without again, without collaborating with our marketing colleagues, without collaborating with our change management experts, our technology experts, um, our data uh, and, uh, analytics experts, we, we're not going to change from an evidence base and you know, from an experiential perspective, the worldview of traditional leaders. Okay, great. I just wanna go back quickly to, and I think the question came up as well, um, to the changing world of work. And I'm gonna direct that to Ruane um, and his team specifically. Uh, guys, uh, and tell me quick, uh, let's talk about the, the, the future world of work in the context of work is not done by, uh, by the human anymore. Um, we have an interaction with uh, algorithms, with AI systems and processes, with robotics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How do you see that play out? And that brings me to the next question, which was actually the issue was raised by Theo already, whether the name shouldn't be changed of industrial and organization psychologist to work psychologist, for instance. Um, and then the last point on that, somebody asked also the question right to, at the start, what is going to happen to um, industrial organization psychologists who are not going to change with the times or quickly change with the times? So um, you three guys, can you maybe tackle this? Well, then I'll get Esther to go with the first. Uh, Esther, you want to go? You want to give um, a response to the question around the sure. party? <clears throat> yeah, the robots are coming, eh? So <laughs> I think it's normal to be fearful of, of um, new things. I think, you know, uh, when when ele electricity came, those of you who've watched Downton Abbey, it, it was also a monster, you know, the, the radio, etc. cetera. Um, so we've been through many iterations of where technology has replaced roles, have uh, changed our lives, et cetera. So, I think the first thing is just to engage with it with curiosity and enthusiasm firstly and see how these technologies can be used to to solve problems and to elevate our thinking and to uh, it's interesting that the digital and distributed world actually makes us be intentionally human and connected so this is the intentional humanity here is the, the value we need to add and what's very important from an IOP perspective. And that's the conversation we need to bring to the table is I've been in conversations where AI has been discussed and I asked the question about bias. I asked the question about uh, how social media has created, for example, polarization, et cetera, and how do we address this? And to be bold about it and to be uh, comfortable in your stance as an IOP that humanity needs to be at the center of this. So I, I think, uh, yeah, I see the Naomi, thank you, uh, being intentionally human and, and we do run a risk if we do not play our role. And I don't wanna create that as a kind of a, um, a fearful narrative of the future. I would rather create a hopeful narrative of the future and uh, reiterate our, our responsibility to participate in that meaningful creation of this legacy of the future. Um, and, and I think we need to do it very intentionally. I, Ruana, I hope I answered the, the question. No, absolutely. And, and you know, as Esther's in, in, the, in the thick of this, uh, working with organizations to map how to respond to the future. So um, uh, thanks for that, Esther. I, I think my, my response, uh, Valhelm, to the question around the name, you know, what is in the name? I think um, we could change our name to whatever that uh, whatever we want it to be, right? But unless we change, um, linking this to what Sharon was talking earlier, uh, the maps with which we approach the world, then we're not going to have a different outcome. So I think it's not just about 
um, the name, but also to think about, as you think about the different chapters where we cover, um, the ethics uh, associated with how we approach the work we do, the response in terms of what Natasha's covered in her, in her chapter, and also how do we educate the future IOP leaders? And so I think it's important to think about what we call ourselves, but we also need to think about the impact that we want to have as IOPs uh, on organizations. Mm. Okay. Um, Peter? Well, Alam, if I may add to that, I think just to support Ruane and Esther's point, I think we also make the argument that we have to rethink around what we think work is and where work takes place. And I think that will also then filter through quite extensively around the role that we need to play as work psychologists of the future. And I think to be involved in those conversations around how do we intentionally design those, the, those points of augmentation between human beings and technology and the opportunities that it does provide. And I want to add to Esther's point that I think our mindset needs to be one that the future world of work holds opportunity. And yes, opportunity always comes with fear in terms of what we're facing at the moment. But the argument we, wait, we make is that there is actually opportunity if we are willing to change the way we think about work and how work works. Um, and I think that's an important thing for us to consider and play a role in the design of that future. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, that's a, a great summary of the, the, the situation. Crystal, um, on research, um, I think you, uh, Theo mentioned a couple of issues around research that it's uh, taking too long, that it's irrelevant, um, that it is not practical enough. And my question is, but that is not only about industrial psychology or industrial organization psychology. You, you find that among, let's call it management research. If you look at the Academy of Management, I just call it esoteric. You can't really apply anything about that comes out there. And they've now, by the way, and I have to chuckle, they've come up with sexy titles for the research. And then when you read it, you can't really do anything about it. But in any case, um, what can be done to make it more practical? And by the way, um, seeing that we're dealing with a, a revolution that we've seen over the last 18 months, to what extent is stuff that's been done before research um, still relevant to the day and, this day and age with the hybrid world environment and so on? And well, Helen, I'm going to pass that on to Beatrice. We, we thought about that question long and hard before the time. So Beatrice, would you like to respond? Thanks. Um, so I think I'm going to go back to what Theo said, that a lot of research is being done outside of universities, um, already being done in organizations. And we need to find a way to get that research into the public domain, so to speak. Um, so I'm just thinking out loud is to almost like have a, a shorter peer review process. So not to publish it in a journal article because that, that we already do and I'm not quite sure everyone's reading it. Um, so if we start taking or create a platform for organizations and their teams to share the research that they are doing, um, but still to make sure that the research that they are trying to share and the knowledge that they are trying to share is still based on scientific principles, yet practical, meaning covering real world situations from multiple perspectives, et cetera, um, that could be the way to go. So uh, if I sort of like had a wish list, and maybe just for the record, no, Valhallam, I'm not getting paid for saying this, um, but to start sharing um, those practical research components in, in newsletters. I do know that Knowledge Resources has got a newsletter um, and maybe we can start uh, collaborating with the different platforms to share that practical research with individuals, not just inside industrial psychology, but also outside. So uh, to make that process as seamless and easy and as fast as possible without um, actually creating um, or sharing poor research is to start doing that, uh, making it more practical to get those uh, organizations to publish their stuff, not in journals, uh, but more in, in, in almost like, dare I say, industry newsletters, magazines, um, but yet still going through a, a peer review process. Okay, I see Crystal, thanks for that. Uh, Crystal? I think Theo's hand was up before me. Theo, do you want to respond? Okay, sorry, I didn't. I think also we face a more fundamental problem, and we actually give uh, we we give examples of that in the chapter that was done by 
by Crystal and, and uh, Beatrice. The complexity of the world is overwhelms the research methodology. We currently have to investigate that, that complexity. And it's admitted to by leading researchers in our field that says we haven't got powerful enough research techniques to actually be reflective of the true reality that organizations face and have to deal with. So we have an even more fundamental problem, uh, which we will have to very uh, carefully investigate and, and see how do we bring the complexity of the world out there into our research. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to respond just to this question of relevance and impact of research. And for me, the question or, or the solution is actually very simple, or the principle is very simple. And we must shift from academic impact to societal impact. How do you assess whether research um, is impactful or not? It's a simple question. Can you demonstrate why the work that you do or the research that you do that you are creating real change? How do you measure that change? How significant is that change? Is it changing the lives of people for the better? And that for me is also a fundamental question in the work that IOPs do. And, and you, can, you can also use the question there. The work that we do, can we demonstrate that it's making a difference, that is improving the lives of people? If not, we are busy with the wrong things. So the question is simple. The solution might, or, or, or the way to get there might be a little bit more complicated, but that for me is the essence of it. Mm -hmm. Well, Helen, if you allow me, I just want to build on what Crystal yes. is saying. I think as scientists as well, because we know that there are a lot of non-scientific information that's flooding the media. So we do need to be rigorous. We need to tell the truth, but we need to find ways to get it out there. So to talk to, uh, to Crystal's point around who are we doing this research for is to benefit our organizations, to benefit our leaders and to benefit our society. They do not read academic journals. We read academic. So um, as social scientists, we mustn't be scared for the public um, domains out there. We mustn't be scared to take on social media because the world live on social media. So we might as well start flooding it with the truth because there's a lot of false um, media out there. Um, so it's, it's on us. It's on us to, to change this cycle because they are, um, I know we, we, we're speaking quite negatively about research and the research process and what we do, but there's also good work being done. And uh, if we focus on that, um, use different streams. I've put on the chat things like the Conversation Africa, short bite-sized slices of real authentic research that is turned out very quickly within a couple of months by MBA students or master's students. Um, at our school, we do a platform, Research Meets Industry, where we invite business leaders to come and listen to the research findings that we've had. So I think we, it, it's on us and we must find the answer. We, you know, we can't just look at academia and win. That's a big system to change. We must work with the system, but we need to change it quicker. Because that's that's the, the reality of the world. We, we're not really living in a different technology era. We're just living in a faster technology era. The rate at which things change is just much faster. Um, and we need to keep up. Thanks, Palalem. Thank you. Um, listen, guys, and like with all panel discussions, just when we get going, time starts to run out. Um, I think we, we're about to start wrapping up because we contracted with the delegates until six o'clock, but I think it's so interesting that we can just as well go on for a few more minutes. But yeah, I wanna come back to the research story. Um, are we not fragmenting it too much? Are we not specializing too much? I mean, here's my, my point. We're talking about a hybrid world, uh, um, uh, work practices and so on, and it has major ramifications, not only for the, the industrial psychology and resources field, but also on economics, social, um, social, um, uh, uh, even social work, um, data scientists, uh, behavioral economics, et cetera, et cetera. And to tie in with Marius's original question, um, shouldn't we form, um, a, a, have a more collaborative approach also on the research where the other sort of departments within universities and then uh, formulate uh, a major, well, a major project team like you guys have done and come out with, with various answers to a major problem. For instance, 
How do we decarbonize work? Um, so I would like to hear what you guys are saying there on um, what your views are. Maybe just a quick point, Abel Helm. Um, I think somewhere in the book, if it's not in the last chapter, um, but uh, I can remember during one of the, um, the discussion sessions, we actually shared with one another, but maybe we should get um, business management and strategic management on board um, because they've got a very uh, particular view of um, stakeholder analysis, um, but also um, we've got a particular view of stakeholder analysis. And hence, um, I think Natasha and everyone has mentioned breaking down the silos. Um, and yeah, this thing is too complex for one single profession to solve. And we need those multiple perspectives. So yeah, definitely from, uh, it seems like uh, Natasha is saying more business uh, IOPs in business schools. Um, but yeah, definitely some um, input from business management and strategic management, yes. Good. Um, just the last question, and then we can wrap up. And that's about the future. And the future being our junior uh, newcomers to the field. So there was a question, what, are, what, what, what do you guys propose in terms of upskilling the, uh, the juniors in terms of counseling and uh, psychometricians and, and so on? Um, and then my other question is, what do you think are the major shifts that will be required in terms of the education and the training of IOPs in, in, in future? Um, I think, uh, Shalene, you and Natasha, were the people who worked on on the ETB, um, the, the, the development training, development of IOP. So maybe you guys. Uh, yeah, sorry, Willem, what, what, can you repeat the question? Question is, firstly, what are you guys planning or proposing to upskilling and reskilling our junior, um, uh, juniors in this field? Like, uh, yeah, you would know. Yes. And then the second question is, Going back to the, the academic environment where they are going through their process of edu being educated, uh, what do you propose should be the changes in, that, in, in this respect to make them future fit ready? I think so from a, from a, a learning perspective, Willem, I think learn, the way the new generation is learning is changing um, uh, you know, at, at a very, very rapid pace. In fact, um, long lectures, you know, boring, uh, long textbooks is no longer going to serve the younger generation. We know that research is showing that people want short bite-sized micro-learning um, content, and then they need to have an opportunity to go and practice, you know, what they've learned, the knowledge, experience, and, and theoretical um, uh, information that, they, that they're absorbing. So we've got to, as a strategic initiative, we've got to work closer with um, universities, organizations, and also regulatory bodies to look at um, how does the IOP uh, agenda and program shift into the future that could make them future fit. And, um, and I think we also need to take the premise of, you know, this, um, the maturity curve that Theo has mentioned earlier on, looking at, you know, what is needed at a junior level versus uh, perhaps we're looking to upskill them around data analytics and um, you know the basic uh, ethics and, and morals and values framework. And then as they grow in their curriculum, we want to you know teach them around thought leadership and um, and different content. But but the format, my my worry is that the format of how we're teaching. Um, you know, students, adults is, is shifting at a rapid pace. And we are not, um, as, as universities, we are not, um, uh, you know, we're not responding to the new trends of how people learn. Well, right, Helen, I, come in here. I, I think, but maybe this is more particular, although there could be an application at the undergraduate level in a different form. But I want to uh, focus on the honors and the master's level, and especially at the master's level, where we actually uh, grow our professional IOPs. I think the model we should follow in future, content must be done online. I, let's say it is, let's use Natasha's example of organizational behavior. The content gets done online. I do it online. 
I have six weeks in which to work through the content. I get assessed on the content online. Then I get brought into a situation at the university where I have to solve a particular organizational challenge, issue, problem. And I work under the auspices, the mentorship of experienced uh, practitioners that guide me and show me, and you get assessed on the innovation of your, you can bring other disciplines in that situation. Then you go away after a week, having dealt with a very practical issue, and you can change those issues all the time. And you take a next subject around a well-being, and they study the principles online. We can't waste our time, so to speak, anymore on lectures. Let's, yes, let people self-manage them in terms of the content, get the assessed, and then you look at how it gets applied. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Theo, for that. Rav, you have the last word. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I, I guess mine's maybe more of a generic question, just kind of listening to the panelists and some of the questions. Um, I, I think... The one thing is, like everyone said, there's a lot of complexity in this, and there's a lot of variables that we have to take into consideration of known and unknown elements that are going to impact our profession. And I think the, the simplest way to take it is to, to break it up in smaller bite-sized chunks, uh, whether it's learning, um, whether it's how you approach research. It's about just saying, well, you know, how do I impact something really small, bite-sized, make sure it's accessible. It's something that we can uh, kind of grasp on and engage with other people in, in a way that allows people to give input into it. So it comes to that diversity of thought, that inclusivity, the ability for you to be able to uh, generate ideas quickly is really reliant on the diversity of thought. So I think you know, keeping it isolated to individuals or a group of individuals makes it very difficult for you to be able to go out there and be able to derive solutions that are going to make a shift in the IP profession. If you want to do it quickly, keep it small, Get a lot of people into the room from different backgrounds, different with different ideas and concepts. Uh, make it accessible, and you'll be able to find your way through and navigate this a lot easier. I think we sometimes overthink it, and this, you know the the devil's in the detail. But also, I think the simpler you keep the solution, the better. Yes, fantastic. Now, Natasha, I saw you had your hand up as well, so please go ahead. Um, hi, Willem. Thanks. Um, I also think it's important that um, in universities, as Theo said, when the theory is done, that the application is done in a South African context, and the students get to solve problems, real problems um, that the South African context is grappling with, as opposed to generic ones. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Guys, um, we're, we're starting to run out of time now. So... Uh, the discussion, and if I look at all the other questions and comments that's coming through, uh, it, it proves that uh, there is this need for the December one-day seminar and, uh, and or conference. So uh, please attend uh, and, and support the, the organizers with it. So I think SOAPSA and specifically the, uh, the, the project team should be congratulated with a, with a fantastic piece of work for taking the initiative, for... Um, coming up with very new, fresh perspectives. Um, I think it also serves uh, almost, what you've done almost serves as a template for various other disciplines to, to relook and to, to reinvestigate and uh, reformulate their own sort of capabilities and, um, and areas of practice for the future. So thank you for that. I need to thank also SAPSA for assisting us in, in, in organizing this, uh, this seminar, um, this evening launch. And then also, um, just remember, you can order the book at the moment. Uh, you get the discount. I'm sure there's a discount, 20% of that. And then we on, on the book. And um, I want to thank Sia Uber. Sia, are you here? Um, if you can just put your, your camera on. Where is Sia? There I am. <laughs> there is Sia. Sia is the mother of our publishing division. So um, Sia uh, did the project management of getting it out, getting it together, typeset, everything else. So thanks a lot for, for that, Sia. Um, we appreciate the work you're doing there. And then for Katie, who, um, who put the, the, the launch together and uh, support team, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. And if there's anybody else on the panel that wants to have a last word 
then um, I'm going to give you one second. Let me see. Anybody else? Nobody. Right, guys. That brings us to the yeah. end of the evening. Thank you very much for all your contributions, for your frank discussion and the wonderful advice and inputs that you provided. And uh, well done on a fantastic project. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. See you on December the 2nd, God willing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.